Amen. You got your Bible? Hope you're, uh, hope you're ready this morning. Uh, Val, you can sit down. I got uh, the few folks I got just standing here in obedience. Just it's so funny. Uh, so if you've got your Bible, I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to do three, four verses there. 13, 14, 15, I think. And uh, I'm going to use a couple of different translations this morning. Uh, 46 years ago today, I had my first date with Annie. 46 years ago. I was 12. No. 46 years ago. So Valentine's Day holds a special place in my heart and in Annie's heart because it's uh, 1975, I think. Uh, and uh, we had our first date and uh, we went to a basketball game. That's, that's what you did. You went to a basketball game. And I, I bought chocolate hearts and stuff and she gave them to her mom. And so I remember Valentine's Day. I want, I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13. For if I am beside myself... The Message Bible said, if I acted crazy, it was for God. Or if we are of a sound mind, it is for you. In other words, if I acted crazy, it is because of God. For the love of God compels, or the love of God has moved me to extremes because we judge that if one died for all, then we've all died. And if he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them that rose again. You see, I realize love makes you do crazy things. I started dating Annie in February of 1975, and in August of 1975, I was 17 years old. In August of 75, I was working on a building. My dad was a contractor, and they were building a library in Wichita, Kansas. A guy by the name of Dale Morgan was the guy running the project. And that building was three stories high. It's about 36, 40 foot tall, and we had these uh, scaffolding up on the outside of it. And uh, on that August day of 75, I was climbing up the outside of that tower and that tower fell, fell 36 feet, fell like this and it landed on me. And when it landed on me, it buried me in this sand and they had to pick me up, and take me to Wesley Hospital. And when I came to, they were doing all kinds of x-rays of my back and my neck and my body. And I can remember it was a Friday afternoon and my dad shows up and they've done, I don't remember in those days them having CTs or uh, MRIs, but the x-rays and I hurt and they had this thing on me and I was laying there and they said, well, we're not seeing anything, but with the swelling and everything that's going on, um, you know, we, we just don't know it, one move, maybe he could be paralyzed or this, or we just, we can't tell. So we want him to stay overnight. And, and uh, I remember looking up at my dad going, I, I can't stay here. I can't, I can't stay in the hospital. Said, well, how come? I said, well, I have a date. I have a date. I, I, we got to go. And sure enough, we got up out of that uh, emergency room and I went home and uh, love make you do crazy things. I've often wondered now as years have gone by, if I had allowed that suggestion to enter into my heart about what I had done to my neck, if I had allowed that into my heart, but there was something deeper that was driving me and it was a desire, a love. Love will make you do crazy things. Love will motivate you. Love will move you beyond the norms and affect your behavior. That story has stayed with me because I am convinced that we are so much more than bobbleheads. We are so much more than thinking things. We, we were created for love. We were created to love. We were created to be driven by not what we think, by what we love, rather. And so many times we have succumbed to this world that we get more information and we get smarter and we acquire more of the stuff in our mental and that's what determines us. But the truth of the matter is, is that we are directed by our heart, not our head. That you're never going to change people's behavior by affecting their intellectual ability. You're never, I've been teaching a long time. You can give people all kinds of information. In fact, you can twist with the information. Information doesn't change people. Their hearts is what changes them. Hearts is what drives our behavior. It's what's deep down inside of us. Uh, Descartes was wrong. He said this statement that I think, therefore I am. No, it has nothing to do with that. I love, therefore I am. And if I know I'm loved, I know I'm valued. I know I matter. It's that desire that's down on the, each one of us. And I could change the word a little bit and said what we're wired for, what we want, what we long for, what we crave. You and I have these desires, these dreams. See, without a dream, there'd never been a man on the moon. Without a dream, there'd never been an America. No Columbus, no Ponce de Leon. The dreams, desires, longings, cravings are what motivate people, pull us to become all that God has for us. It's this reality 
that we were taken, taken to, ha- created to have these longings, these desires that would motivate us to accomplish, to become. It'll override everything in our lives. In fact, all you got to do is change someone's desire and you'll change their direction of their life. If their desires change, they'll move in that way. Their heart, it's that inside of us, that desires, those loves that determine our spirituality. In fact, without a love, without a desire, without a longing for the rivers of God, without that, there is no spirituality. That real spirituality is the birth of this love that we have been given towards God. That's why the Bible says, guard your hearts, keep your hearts, hold them steady, hold them together. Because if you don't guard your heart, the enemy will come in to try to influence it and try to get it to want things it shouldn't want. Our entire evangelical mindset of today is all focused around Romans chapter 10. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, not if you think in your head. Not if you rationally come to some sort of mental ascent that Jesus is. No, if something changes down inside of you and you begin to love God back, you begin to to, to feel that love that comes from God. You begin to experience it. And intellectual religious people hate this because they want to argue over doctrine and they want to argue over the rules. They want to argue over this and that. But the truth of the matter is, is Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. He came to touch the heart hearts and the minds of men. The enemy all along has wanted to destroy our heart. He's all along wanted to alter the desires. He's all along wanted to play with that and to remove that understanding. That's why Paul says, if you don't lose heart or uh, if you don't lose heart, you'll reap those things that God has for you. So don't give up on those deep desires You see, right in the beginning, Adam and Eve, God stepped in the middle of that and began to play with that and began to deceive them. That's why deception is so powerful because the enemy wants to come and deceive you into longing for or wanting something other than or more than. Wanting to stop us from trusting that God is the one that loves us and begin to trust that we can shortcut that or do something on our own. And the great proverb, Proverb chapter 23, verse 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so a man is. It didn't say as a man thinks in his head. It didn't say as a man thinks in his intellect. It says as a man thinks in his heart. You see, your heart is so much more than something gray matter that's pumping oil. No, the heart, that soul, that deep down in, for out of the heart come the issues of life. And out of your heart will spring all the rivers of living water. See, the men and the women that were martyred all the way through the Christian tradition, the Peter did not come upon the knowledge that Jesus is the Christ because flesh and blood revealed it to him. But Peter acknowledged that Jesus was Lord because the Father revealed to him. It was a spiritual reality. Polycarp, who was burned at the stake and the fire refused to lick him up and was shot through with an arrow. Listen, Polycarp did not die a death of martyrdom because there was some sort of intellectual reality. No, something happened down on the inside of him so deep that he couldn't deny the reality that Jesus is Lord. You see, when something moves in your heart and touches those desires and those longings, it'll move around your prejudices and your preferences and your preconditioned and your existing conclusions. See, real Christianity is about coming into this understanding that you were created to be with God. Real Christianity recognizes, as Augustine said, that we are restless until we rest in God. That we begin to realize that this restlessness that we have, this longing that we have cannot be satisfied by the things of this world. That the longings and the desires and the fullness that it is to be a human being is, <coughs> excuse me, is only found in its totality when we are loved and love as God has loved us. The prophet Ezekiel said, I'm going to give you a new heart. The prophet Jeremiah said, I'm going to write it into your hearts. David, the great psalmist, prayed that God would create in me a clean heart, that I would have a heart that would desire the God himself, that, that this, this, this desires that I have have somehow gotten twisted and deceived, and that God comes to reacquaint us with the reality of how we were created to long and to search and to know. 
Jesus said, my peace I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Isaiah, that great prophetic word in Isaiah chapter 61, and then repeated in, in uh, Luke chapter 4, said, For the Lord has, is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. The ministry of Jesus is to touch our hearts and to realign, to reset, if you will, to recalibrate, to re the desires that are in us. The tin man wanted a heart, for heaven's sakes. It's one of the greatest stories, right? The tin man didn't need a head. He needed a heart. Jesus did not come asking, what do you know? Or what do you believe even? He didn't even ask what rabbi you're following, what denomination. He didn't even ask any of that. He didn't ask about what was in your head. No, in John chapter 1, when those disciples were following him and they were searching for him, Andrew, he said, what do you want? What do you desire? What are you after? What are you longing for? Deep down inside, have you reflected enough to understand what are those things that you want inside of yourself? See, that's, that's like having a baby that's crying. What does that child need? Everybody's trying to figure out what that child is wanting. Because if you can figure out what the child is wanting, you can bring peace to the child. And the fatal error of humanity today is to pretend that you've already found it. I know so many people. The, the fatal error is that they think they've already found it. And I agree with Bono. We still haven't found what we're looking for. You see, you and I were created in paradise. You and I were created to live in a, an atmosphere of unconditional love. You and I were created to live in a culture where you didn't have to earn your love. You didn't have to prove your love. And you were valued not because of what you could produce or what you could do or not do. You were valued simply because you were created in the image of God. You were valued because you were there. And you and I have come from that. And we long to live in an atmosphere that doesn't judge people. We long to live in an atmosphere where we have no prejudice or preferences, where we're not criticized or condemned. We long to live in an atmosphere where we are fully accepted because we simply are alive with the breath of God. That is heaven. And Jesus comes to begin to stir up that desire that's on the inside of us that cannot be found by following a set of rules out of an ancient book. God comes to stir up that desire for a relationship that touches the hearts and the souls of every human being in such a way that we begin to realize that there really is this place, there really is this God where we are loved unconditionally, that it's not voted on and argued on, it's not debated denominationally or nationally, but it is free of all the jurisdictions of humanity and we are free simply to live in this spiritual reality where we are known and known as we are. That's freedom, and that is Christianity. That is love that's undeserved and unearned. And if I acted crazy, it's because all of a sudden I realized that God died so that we could all live in that heaven, that we could all live in that culture, that we could all live in that environment. And anything short of that makes me hungry for more of where God is. <clears throat> Sorry, i got to remember that I'm on a camera. See, I agree with Bono. I still haven't found that. That'll never be found here. It's never found in this culture, and you'll never make any of this culture around here be that. That will never change the earth to be that way. No, the kingdom will come someday. When Christ came, he did not invite us to be more moral. He didn't invite us into a program. He didn't invite us into that. No, he began to ask us, have you reflectively looked into your heart to ask what you want? Have you spent the time to look inside of yourselves and understand that you long for me? Have you spent the time? Do you even know? All the way through the Bible, Jesus goes around, that man laying by the pool for 38 years, and he walks up and says, D -d do you want to be well? Do you want to be well? That's almost insulting, right? Do you want to be well? But that has to be asked. To Christians at this moment, do you want to be well or you still want to pursue your denominational rules and this and you're criticizing of? Do you, do you, <laughs> I've wanted to ask for four or five years, do you really want to be well or you just want to have the right? No, listen, that's the kind of question we have to ask. Do we want to know this desire that is satisfied only in the presence of God? Two blind men show up and it's obvious that they're blind and Jesus says, what do you want? He's like, come, come on, genius. 
They want their eyesight back. No, he's looking for something deeper. Have you looked down on the inside of yourself and really ask what it is that you long for? In Matthew 7, he said, ask and it'll be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it'll be open. Anything you ask. James says, you have not because you ask not. It's because we haven't done the work to go deep. I need to know that I'm loved. I need to be able to love back. I need to do that without it being judged or criticized. I, I, and Jesus comes to awaken the godly desire. He doesn't come to awaken a human desire. We've got all kinds of human desires, but there is a godly desire. It's created in the image of God. And that godly desire desires to love and to be loved, to live in that freedom of that reality. That in the culture of religious soul-killing spirituality that's so caught up in all these duties and obligations that Jesus steps in and says, listen, do you really want to be loved? And do you really want to love freely? It'll make you act crazy. It'll make the world think you're nuts. You'll be willing to die at a stake. You'll be, wi be willing to be crucified upside down. You really won't care because you'll discover this reality for which you were created. Woman, you've had five husbands and you still aren't satisfied. If you knew who I was and the gift that I have, you'd ask of me, what's he saying? Hun, in the middle of your life, you're still unsatisfied and you're never going to find it here. You see, God steps into the middle of our world and says, you're still dissatisfied. He said, I've come to do more than just forgive you. I've come not to threaten you. I've come to reveal to you that I am what you need. That, that you'll be restless until you come to rest in who I am. I mean, think about it. Zacchaeus climbed a tree. He was too short. Zacchaeus had heard. Zacchaeus had all the money in the world. He had everything he needed. But he still wasn't satisfied. And so when he heard Christ was coming, he climbed a tree, looked up at the tree, and Christ looked up at him. You see, the whole story of Christ coming to the world was to reveal that we will never find our love here. We'll never find everything we need to be in all of this meandering. But that when Christ comes, I mean, faith is really no more, no less than the revelation of my hunger. Faith is that blind man on the road screaming out for the mercy of God. Faith really is revealed passion. I have discovered that Christ has died for one. And if he died for one, he died for all. Therefore, Paul says, all of the laws of Judaism mean nothing. Because if God died for one, he died for all. It moves me to such extremes to declare that God's grace is sufficient for everyone and everything. We need to recover this message in the heart of America. We need to recover that the only message that would make people tear off roofs and climb trees and, and, and be crucified upside down is the knowledge that they have found the one. Moses had that kind of desire. I mean, Moses said, show me your glory. Moses, who received the Ten Commandments. Moses, who led the children out of Israel. Moses, who followed them around for 40 years. Moses stands there at that cloud and goes, let me see your glory. Irenaeus makes this statement, the glory of God is man fully alive. Let me see your glory. Listen, the glory of God is when you and I are so fully alive that we're pulsating with the very life of God. That we are, if you will, just glowing with the very life of God. That humanity, you and I, the human race, Adam, Eve, all of you, Bill, Joe, John, all of you were created to be vessels, temples of God. And that when man is filled with the love of God and overflowing, there's the glory of God. The glory of God is man fully alive. And Moses said, I, I want to see your glory. And he said, I can't show it to you yet, but I'll let you see the backside of it. I, I love David. David says, one thing I have desired and that will I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord and behold his beauty and inquire in his temple. One thing I have desired. Paul said, I, I have not yet attained, but one thing I do is I press forward. You see, my friends, we as Christians today need to recover that there is one thing that can satisfy us, and that is our union with God. There is one thing and one thing only that can bring us into the fullness of who God created us to be, and that's our union, our oneness with God. 
And that oneness is possible because he became one of us to die that we might become one again with him. And that we could live in that reality. And it will bypass all intellectualism. It will bypass all rationalism. It will bypass all common sense. It will bypass all of that. And it will cause Ignatius to say, don't try to save me. I'm going to die for Jesus. It it, will bypass all of the things that are rhetoric on Google and on anything else. Because when you are captured by the reality that the God of heaven loves you so much that he would become a man and die for you, you realize all at once that God is restoring us into that unity of this unconditional love in the reality that everything else grows so pale and that every other voice grows so diminished that you you act crazy. And Paul said, I know, I'm crazy. I'm moved to extremes because I've realized that there is no amount of religious duty and obligation, rules and relationships, measuring of right or wrong, equating of prejudice or preferences or what. None of that, none of that in this world matters. For I love not the world nor the things therein. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is this relationship. And when you touch it, when you see it, when you catch a glimpse of it, it'll make you get up out of an emergency room. It'll make you defy everything. In just a simple, small way, a 17-year-old boy, the idea of love make me get up and do stuff. Well, the reality of love can do even more than that if we could remember that Paul writes, if you have not love, you are nothing. Now, there's nothing less than nothing. If you have not this love, if you've not known that you're loved, I've realized that, 62, moving on to 63, the only message I have is that God loves you. He loves you so much he cuts through your sin. He loves you so much he cuts through your prejudice and your preferences and all of that. He cuts through that and says, watch this. I'm here to ask you a question. What do you want? And then he's going to go to a cross to reveal his love for you. And at the end of this, he's going to go, well, do you love me yet? Because the fullness of humanity is only found in that restored relationship of love, unmerited and unearned, but given as a gift. And Paul said, without love, you can talk in tongues, you can have money, you can be the wisest and the smartest people in the world. But if you are not loved, and if you don't love, you're nothing. Absolutely nothing. But if you've realized that Jesus is the manifestation of the totality of God, who in and of himself is love, who has compassion and empathy, takes our place, is resurrected for us. It changes everything. And I love David. It's one thing I've desired, and that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord. I've spent nearly 40 years to behold the beauty of the Lord, to behold the beauty of the Lord when it's two below zero. Can I tell you something about COVID? It is already conditioning us for nothing but convenience. COVID is conditioning Christians that if it's not convenient, I can't do it. COVID is conditioning us. When COVID started, it was all about, is the government going to keep us from gathering? The government will never keep us from gathering, but a cold heart will. That's not what this is. Listen to me. One thing I have desired, I still get up in the morning and I want to behold the beauty of the Lord in the two below zero, in the wind that's blowing, or in the sun that's baking, or in a baby that I can see, or in my wife for 43 years. To behold the beauty of the Lord in another human being. To see the face of another human being, no matter what the race, creed, color, denomination, or faith they possess. To see the beauty of God in every fingerprint of life. To see the beauty of God when the sun goes up, the sun comes down. To see the beauty of God in the storm and in the calm. To see the beauty of God today and every day and every way. To behold the beauty of the Lord. One thing I desire, Lord, is let me see your glory. Let me see your beauty. Let me see it. That I might inquire. That I might seek to understand. That yes, my mind would change. But only after my heart is filled with the knowledge of this love and of this glory. Wow. So yeah, it's Valentine's Day. 
And so we'll buy cards and we'll remember and we'll begin to think again about this love that we have for hopefully someone in our life. I hope you're as blessed as just a little bit as I am. St. Augustine says, every weight sings, seeks its own atmosphere. If fire, if you ever watch fire, fire seeks to go up. Uh, stones seek to go down. That every element seeks its own atmosphere. Uh, and that we were made for the love of God. And that we would be restless until we rest in God. And so the things that are not in their intended position will remain forever restless. Today, if you're restless, if you haven't found what you're looking for, it's because you haven't allowed yourself to be received into and to receive that. It, uh, the best way I can describe it is I take my children swimming, uh, uh, my grandchildren swimming, and, and, and they have beach balls. And they have so much fun taking this blown up beach ball and holding it underwater. Have you ever, have you ever tried to do this? Try to hold the beach ball underwater. What happens? It rises to the surface because it seeks its own. It seeks its own. See, the enemy wants to hold us underwater. The truth of the matter is, is that we have been called. Our, our, our desire is to come to the surface. Our desire is to live in the love of God. Our desire is to live in a grace-filled atmosphere. Our desire is to live in this reality of the presence of God. That's our desire. To hold it underwater, it, 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 it struggles. Or I, I could tell it to you in scripture. The young prodigal son had taken all that his father had to give him. And he went off and he squandered it. You remember that? Chapter 15 of Luke. And there's a great verse in there. It says, when he came to himself. <laughs> when he remembered in his heart that his father was good. When he remembered that, it says he got up and went home. He got up off the emergency table and went on the date. See, love. Love will change behaviors. Love will alter the way we feel, the way we act, the way we think. Most of American religion today has opted out of real love and has opted into some sort of doctrinal dissertation trying to inform people so that they'd become good. You never give enough information. You reveal the love of God. And in revealing the love of God, change the hearts and the minds of men and women. And yes, intellect follows. Um, Valentine's Day. I just thought I'd tell a silly story about a silly boy who recognized and could see this love and move towards it. Today, if you're restless, if you're dissatisfied, if you're dissatisfied with your spiritual condition, if you're dissatisfied with your earthly position, if you're dissatisfied, if there's something inside of you and that you're not experiencing that joy and that fullness, and that completedness, it's the day to ask Jesus into your heart. It's the day to ask the Lord to come flooding in and reveal in you that your heart longs for that love, that pure, unadulterated, if you will, love of God. It's very simple. If you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess with your mouth, you shall know that love. So, Father, I pray right now that there anyone listening to me, that, Father, they would just simply ask you to make yourself known to them. That, Jesus, you would reveal your love into the heart of every person right now. Jesus, come into my life. Reveal your love to me. Fill me with your spirit. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you have your elements of wine and bread there, I'm just going to encourage you to get it. Uh, one of the very, very main reasons about having wine and bread is that it helps us to remember that he loved us so much that he died for us. It's like <laughs> reminding each other of the Valentine, right? So if you get your bread and your wine, I 
Hallelujah. Next Sunday, we're going to have communion together here in the house. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus came to say, what do you want? What do you need? What are you after? I'm after this knowing of love. I'm after that. And so on the night of his betrayal, he took the bread and the wine and he said, this is my body of love. This blood is my life. He blessed it. He broke it. He poured it out. He gave it to them and said, I love you. I love you. I love you so much that I'll take your place. I love you so much I'll die for your sin and your punishment. I love you so much that I'll not withhold anything I have from you. Hmm. And then he said, as often as you come together, would you pick up bread and would you pick up wine? And would you remember that he was broken, he was poured out, he was given for us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For Christ has died and Christ is risen and Christ will come again. Holy Spirit, come upon these gifts here and at home. Come upon your people and may they know your love. The body and the blood of Christ, broken and shed for you. Amen. It is always an honor for you to be with us. Today we're gathered together and we're all online, right? Just the family online. Um, last year's been a real challenge with COVID and viruses and now weather and all these things. With voices, uh, I just want to tell you, I realized a long time ago that the only message I truly had was to tell you God loves you. And I try to tell you that in such a way that it would reach into your heart and get around the dragons of your mind a little bit with the reality that God's love is so complete, so total, so undescribable that all those things that spin in our head have to bow to the knowledge that I'm loved unconditionally. He didn't love me because I thought it all correctly. <laughs> he didn't love me because I'm doing it all right. He loved me because he's love. That is so satisfying, so absolutely gratifying. It still enraptures me and it still carries me out of this world. And it is my hope in the afterlife. Um, and so in person, online, I hope more than anything else that you know that the Father loves you without conditions, so much that he sent his son to show you that he would die for you. And that they sent their spirit into your hearts to shed abroad the love of God in your life that you might call upon the Father. Father, in Jesus' name, warm every heart, warm every mind, love every soul. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look you in your eyes and grant you his peace. Amen.